Director Pennycook, Honorable Minister, Honorable Consul General, Chairman, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. I, first of all, would like to say uh, on behalf of the Chairman of the Council of Ministers of the Caribbean Tourism Organization and the entire CTO family, what a pleasure and an honor it is for us to be involved in what really is clearly going to be an historic occasion in Jamaica, November 27 to 29. Sometimes we forget to do the most basic things, so I'm going to ask you to make sure uh, that you, uh, who are all on, your <laughs> all on your mobile devices now, make sure that you put that into your calendars uh, and clear the spaces right around it as well, uh, because I'm sure that you don't just want to go to Jamaica for the event, but you want to make sure that you are there to fully enjoy uh, the venue that has been so aptly described to you by Paul Pennycook. Um, the Council of Ministers and, uh, and Commissioners of Tourism of the CTO, we are the Tourism Development Agency for the Caribbean, as you know, and uh, the, 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 the Council of Ministers have, in fact, endorsed this for what it really is. First and foremost, Jamaica has for a long time taken a leadership role in Caribbean tourism. The Honorable Minister Ed Bartlett is, um, is, is a veteran in the industry and we are extremely proud that he has taken the initiative to bring this one-of-a-kind, first-in-class, in really, event uh, to Jamaica. Nothing like it has happened before and we're extremely proud that it's coming to the Caribbean. So um, I've been told that uh, uh, by the way, legally we're we're in Jamaica now. This is Jamaican soil, <laughs> just Jamaican soil, and we can make as much noise as we want. Apparently, so I want to give a round of applause first of all to Jamaica for making this thing happen in the Caribbean. Uh, you can't make that much noise in some parts of New York, but we're in Jamaica right now. So, so thank you, Minister uh, Bartlett and team, for that. Paul Pennycook pointed out that we are the most tourism-dependent region in the world, and statistically, we are. So. The, the numbers show that in terms of contribution to GDP, the number of our people that tourism employs, the direct and, and indirect uh, and induced impact, tourism really is, is our livelihood in the Caribbean. But we can't just be the most tourism dependent region in the world. We have to be the most tourism competent. And because we are the most tourism defend, dependent, we have to care more. So we go to an event like this, assembled by the minister and his team, to make sure that we understand how to deliver an experience, because we have to care more about the quality of the experience that we deliver to the people who come to our region and, and who come to our country. We have to care more about the quality of the training that we have. We have to care more about product development in the Caribbean and we have to care more about the sustainability of our industry for our children and grandchildren. So this kind of event brings together the thought leaders from around the world. The details will be described to you uh, shortly, but you will find that this is a conference that is not only well worth your attending, but your writing and photographing and doing images about. So uh, we look forward to seeing you there. And once again, Minister, thank you so much for allowing the Caribbean Tourism Organization to be a part of this great event. Thank you. Thank you. And our other major regional partner, the Caribbean Hotel and Tourist Association, represented today by Matt Cooper. I'll now invite Matt to say a few words. Thank you, Mr. Director, and thank you to the Consul General for, for welcoming us here this morning. Thank you, Minister Bartlett. And Mr. Riley for your contributions and your collaboration along the way. We're here to represent the hotel and tourism industry in the region, which is the largest employer in the region. We represent um, the biggest industry. We have members in 32 destinations in the region, a thousand members, whose livelihood depends on tourism. Sustainability to us is a matter of practicality and it is a matter of survival. We live and work in the most expensive place in the world to do business. The most expensive, starting with the kilowatt hour. And right hand in hand with that is water, which is very expensive in an increasing way. So therefore, we need to be vehement defenders and champions of sustainability at every level. Starting with the environment, because without our beautiful, precious resources, we have absolutely nothing to sell. And that is in, in the water, 
in the water we drink, in the water where we swim, and by land. Secondly, and right along with the first point, is sustainability of our people. So this is about people. And this is the way that we get our world leaders to pay attention. For them to understand that this is the biggest industry in the world, 11% contributor to global GDP by 2020. More than manufacturing, more than automotive, more than any other industry in the world. And it is certainly the largest industry in our world. And it's personal. It feeds families. It's fed my family, my father's family in the Everglades. We're impacted on a daily basis by what happened to the environment. And still out there, they're impacted. And so now my life is personally impacted by tourism, and so is everybody else's in this room. So it's a very personal thing. And, w and I want to thank you for being here and being champions with us. We are really looking forward to this collaboration. And we thank you for the invitation to the table. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> Some of you may know, this is in fact the second iteration for Honorable Minister of Tourism serving in this capacity. And for Minister Bartlett, tourism to Jamaica is a bit more than just the arrivals increasing year over year. Tourism is the central platform in our economy that drives the economy. And Minister Bartlett is a passionate advocate of the importance of tourism, not only to Jamaica, but in fact, the region. In addition to that, he also advocates very strongly that tourism needs to be sustainable and it needs to benefit the local community. That is why this conference is so timely and it's welcome that we're having it in Jamaica. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you the Honorable Ed Bartlett, Minister of Tourism from Jamaica, who will, of course, tell us more about the conference and about sustainable tourism development. Minister Bartlett. Thank you very much, Director. Paul Pennycook, our oh, very affable, eloquent, and efficient Consul General, <laughs> through the deans. My friend Hugh Riley from the CTO, and Matt Cooper from the CHTA, Chairman Lynch, and my team from Jamaica who are here, our very capable and efficient public relations team from the United States and arguably <coughs> the world, <laughs> <laughs> members of the media. This is a very pleasant morning for us from Jamaica and tourism. It's also a very exciting moment for the Caribbean and I think for global tourism because as you've heard already, this is the year that has been designated by the United Nations as the year for international sustainable tourism for development. And I think the critical element of that phrase is for development. And so the UNWTO has been looking at how can we structure and fashion activities and programs throughout this year which will accentuate development. But most importantly, and you've heard some of it said already, so it's in my text, I will not repeat. Tourism is indeed the number one industry in the world today, surpassing the extractive <coughs> industries. 
including oil. And employs some 10% of global labor. That is one in 10 of everybody who is working in the world is working in tourism in one way or another, directly or induced. And that translates to 293 million people. And it is expected that by 2030, that figure will go to 350 million people. Last year alone, 1.2 billion people traveled across the world in search of experiences. And they spent directly $1.3 trillion. But the cumulative effect of tourism expenditure globally was really $76.3 trillion. And so what we're saying then is that 10% of global GDP tourism, 30% of world trade in services, and 1 in 11 jobs worldwide. That's the size and power of tourism. So it's evident then that Tourism is an economic powerhouse that creates opportunities to improve the livelihoods of millions. Nonetheless, tourism is underrepresented in funding by bilateral and multilateral donors, representing less than half a percent of the gross development financing in 2015. In real dollar terms for the US, just a little under 250 million. 80% of tourism is driven by small and medium entities. 80% of global tourism is driven by small and medium entities. What I am dubbing SMTEs, small and medium tourism entities. And yet, the resource flows into building out the capacity of this key sector is hugely understated. Linkages between tourism and other economic sectors are often overlooked by planners and policymakers, which diminish the industry's ability to magnify economic and development gains, both at the national and the global level. At the same time, countries increasingly realize they need to develop their tourism economies as an important growth sector. I mentioned the fact that tourism is bigger than extractive industries. But the point that is increasingly being recognized is that tourism is replacing, in most economies of the world, the traditional economic forms. When you look at countries that is in the past had focus on the petroleum industry and oil in particular. And you see them now transiting to tourism, Dubai, Abu Dhabi. The Emirates have become a, a great center of tourism. In fact, um, Dubai mm -hmm. is the largest tourism marketing center in the world today. The level of tourism experiences, the variety and quality are unbelievable. And certainly, it's the shopping mecca of the world, which is the second largest reason for people to travel. So yet, despite the importance of tourism in the world economy, many countries still lag behind in benefiting from it. I think that is where I want to focus on why the conference. So in order for us to stem what we call tourism leakage. We must develop the absorptive capacity by building out the linkages in our communities to capture the tourism dollar. A UNEP report which was done in 2014 suggested that as much as 80% of tourism expenditure leaks out of host countries. In the case of the Caribbean, we are at the highest, even though we are the most tourism dependent. We are at the level of the 80%. 
In the case of Jamaica, we had 30. I mean 30 retention, meaning 70 leak. <laughs> um, I think the best performing country for us in the Caribbean is the Domrep, where they have a 50% retention. But the best country in the world for retention is, Ch is Q um, India. And they have a 40% leakage, a 60% retention. So, if tourism is to be the driver of economic growth and enrichment, if it is to be the lever for job creation and inclusive growth, then it has to respond to the demand to retain more of its expenditure in the host countries. So national planning capabilities then need to be improved. Investment and development frameworks must be strengthened. The legal government, sorry, the legal environment requires improvement. And the capacity of the tourism trade stroke local beneficiaries needs strengthening, as does international collaboration and synergy. So our challenge, therefore, for the conference is to respond to these critical prerequisites for tourism development by addressing the need for public and private investment finance and how it can be expanded through innovative linkages. And therefore, our objectives for the conference. So at the core of our thinking are the following objectives. One, to explore the threats to sustainable tourism development and identify the opportunities for governments to effect policy. Second, to prepare small and medium tourism enterprises. Here's my SMTE, right? Yes. To develop sustainable business models that will attract traditional and non-traditional funding. And three, to expand community tourism templates to generate economic growth and decrease tourism leakage. And fourth, to establish dynamic framework for public-private linkage across government, multilateral agencies, and donor agencies to build out the infrastructure to absorb the tourism growth. And I want to make a, a moment on this with you because understanding what tourism brings to a destination is key. One tourist brings the possibility for 75 jobs in a community. One barrel of oil brings the possibility of five jobs. Because tourism is a series of moving parts which must be converged seamlessly to create an experience that people pay for. So there's no single experience that a visitor craves by way of his passions that can be generated by a single act or indeed a single economic activity. It's a series of economic activities that must converge. And you could look at the first time you, you decide to travel you, you need a travel agent, or if you probably go online, and everything that is involved in creating that. And you go to the, the airport and look at all that is at the airport. The range of economic activities at the airport, all connected to that one travel, that one visitor. But it, is, it has just started. When you leave the airport, you then have to be transported. That's another whole series of economic activity that determines that transportation. Then you go to the hotel, and then there's a whole range of other economic activities that make the hotel happen. And then you leave the hotel to go into the community, to the restaurants, to the attractions, to the beach, to the parks, to the museums, a whole range of it. That's the point we're making, is that level of constant connectivity, a value chain that is deep, long, and wide. And therefore, it has, at every level of that value chain, 
his jobs, his earnings, his wealth. And we've often said that when a plane lands in a destination, it brings wealth. When a ship docks at the port, it brings wealth. The capacity to convert that wealth into livelihood and earnings and jobs is our challenge. So, it is through these linkages then that we can stem the tide of tourism leakage that threatens our ability to harness the total benefits that tourism brings. So the conference will bring together multilateral financial agencies. If you notice that in the frame of the conference, the World Bank is central. So it's the UNWTO, the government of Jamaica, and the World Bank group. And with that, we'll be bringing multilateral lending agencies. IDB, CDB from the Caribbean, IMF, all those international lending agencies that have to present financial support to build out the capacity of the tourism industry to deliver better experiences at the local level and to enable job creation for the people. I wanted to make that point to you because people is at the center of tourism. Tourism is the most people-centric industry in the world. People travel to meet people, to interact with people, to experience relationships, to see the differences and to glory in the similarities. It's all about people with people. So tourism diplomacy is the most powerful tool in the world. And we have to build out the capacity and the ability of destinations to make people benefit even more from the industry. So the academics Universities across the world are going to be involved in this conference. NGOs are going to be involved in this conference. And the two key arms of tourism, which traditionally have been separated, we're bringing them together for this conference. That is cruise tourism and what we call land-based tourism. <coughs> that is the hotels on the one hand, and the cruise lines on the other hand. When you look at that amalgam of tourism interests, you could see that this conference is going to be unique in the sense that it's the first time in the history of any global gathering that all the key stakeholders and beneficiaries and benefactors of tourism are going to be brought together in one place. The nearest thing we had to that was a meeting in Washington in 2004 when George Washington University and the then WTO brought some of the multilaterals together with the private sector. But this is bringing 197 ministers from across the world. 528 companies that are part of the UNWTO's affiliate network, a network that I chair. Major universities, heads of state and government. Newly appointed what we call tourism ambassadors who are persons of prominence and people who have had impact in the industry globally. And the heads of multilaterals. Uh, next week we go to Washington to meet with the OAS, 
the head of the World Bank, the head of the IDB, and so on, to ensure that they themselves are participants in this conference. We have already had an indication of it, but we have to go to do what we have to do. You know the drill. <laughs> Finally, I want to indicate to you that the Caribbean, because of how tourism dependent we are, and Hugh Riley spoke so well, eloquently and well about it. But I just wanted to add that one in four workers in the Caribbean are employed to tourism. One in four. In the case of Jamaica, one in five. That last year, tourism brought $27 billion of foreign exchange into the Caribbean. Jamaica only got 2.56, but we're working on it. We're going to do much more to this year. That 41% of the exports and services in the Caribbean are related to tourism. And tourism represents 31% of the gross domestic product of the region overall. In some of our countries, tourism represents over 50% of the GDP. But I indicated earlier about the horrendous leakage. So we're going to be spending the first afternoon, the entire first afternoon of the conference, the 27th, on the future of tourism in the Caribbean. I will be looking at a whole range of futuristic trends and projections for the Caribbean. But critical to all of it is going to be to discuss the absorbing capacity, the absorbing capacity of the Caribbean for the demand that tourism brings. That 80% leakage has got to go. And we're going to be focusing on how do we bring capital, finance, with creativity, and innovation to enable the Caribbean people to earn more and more of that dollar stays within the Caribbean. I'm sorry I'm perhaps extending my discussion with you a little beyond what my time was slotted to do. But I see the need for us to look a little bit um, on this absorbing capacity. Because people will argue that foreign direct investment is so necessary for tourism. And I agree, it must be. Because the acquisition cost of the tourists is very high. So we have to look at tourism in two key elements of the matrix. One is on what I call the production side, producing the tourists. And then the second, the consumption side. And I believe that foreign direct investments must come to help you to drive the production side, to build the big hotels and create big airports and the infrastructure that is required and the great marketing push that must be made and the tour operators and the airlines and so on. But the consumption side belongs to the people in the destination. It's the experience. And people travel for experiences. So we must build the capacity of our people to generate those experiences so the consumption side of the, of the matrix can be owned by the people. And that's how the dollar will stay. So we'll be spending a little time on that. We'll be looking at the markets, source markets. Where do we go for the next wave of, of, of arrivals in the industry? With airlift, what do we do, do about air connectivity? But key, key to all of this is what do we do with safety and security? This is the number one issue in tourism today. And it cannot avoid us or escape our attention. The discussions. So, 
Tourism is no longer tourism by chance, as in the days gone by. The concept of tourism by study is quickly being adopted by policymakers, tour operators, hotels, and restaurants. And so the variety of data becomes important, especially as we aim to attract those travelers with different passion points while taking other elements into consideration, such as the economic, environmental, and the social impact. Additionally, as we seek to encourage investment by multinational brands and agencies in our respective territories, we must also create a framework for the small and medium tourism entities and community tourism investors to access the data so that our communities can keep up with the ever-changing characteristics and demands of the world traveler. An important outcome of the conference, therefore, will be the compilation of the draft Montego Bay Declaration. And from this will flow an action plan for tourism destinations to follow, as well as the publication of the second volume of the UNWTO Global Report on Public-Private Partnerships. This is seminal because out of the deliberations of all these elements that are being brought together, the multilateral donor countries, the ministers, the NGOs, the crews, the land base, the airlines, and the small tourism entities, the little people in the communities that do the food experience, like Stush in the Bush. Anybody here know Stush in the Bush? <laughs> or Fish Fry? <laughs> or Austin's, right? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> The little people who do the oils and wraps and who use the biodiversity to great creative effect, providing alternative medicine too, and enabling health and wellness. All of those will come together to celebrate on this great industry and to give an output that will be codified, documented, and presented to the UN to help to inform the next millennial goals after 2030. And that is the powerful output from this. So that becomes a legacy, a blueprint of the declaration, therefore, will comprise of three points. One, to share proven international best practices for developing sustainable tourism partnership. Two, to build an inventory of major international development and funding opportunities. And three, to provide governments with improved tourism development investment roadmaps. <laughs>